is. Now the question is, how do we do that uh, in practice? In practice, it comes to finding structure in data and extrapolating it into the future. So from statistics course or any other uh, course that you might have taken, you know that there is always in time series element uh, of structure and element of the white noise, some randomness. We cannot predict randomness because it's uh, it, it takes all, all the individual aspects in, in, in it. So what we need to do is we need to capture the structure correctly and then when we have the structure we can measure the, the noise somehow and produce our forecasts. So if we were all in one room, I would ask you uh, what will happen in the future based on this plot. And I think we would all agree that if we take the structure here, then it's increasing and most probably the future will be that it will increase as well. So that will be our forecast. And this, this is something more or less logical to, to get from a forecasting model. We've uh, realized that uh, there is a trend there is an increase and we are just continuing extrapolating it into the future. Note, however, that uh, there are some fluctuations around this trend. So it's not just trend, right? So this noise is there. We just uh, need it to filter it out and to use this structure to, to do our prediction. Right, so that's the rough idea how to do that. Now the question is what is uh, what's, what elements of structure are there in the data? And there are different approaches of how to deal with the structure, uh, how to capture it. I will focus my talk on statistical ones, so I'm not going to machine learning and other techniques. So let's start with the basic one, classical decomposition. What does it tell us? It tells us that any time series, uh, let's call it YT, uh, might have several components. It might have level, it might have trend or growth. Uh, it might have seasonality or er and error term. Typically, error term is present uh, in every uh, time series, but we can have a combination of the three somehow. So trend here is a bit um, confusing term because what is meant here is actually growth or rate or something like that. It shows uh, by how much our level will change in this uh, taxonomy. Okay, so we have these elements. What can we do with that? We can combine them in different ways in order to get different types of time series. For example, we can have uh, we can add them or multiply them. And here is a, an additive model where we have a level component which changes somehow over time. A trend component it changes somehow on its own seasonality and error. By adding them up, we have our time series. And when we assume this sort of structure, then we can split time series into these components and work with them, use them for prediction. Uh, we can also have pure multiplicative model. If we do that, we just multiply those components. Uh, note that I, I use this one plus epsilon t. This, uh, this is the notation used by Heinemann et al. in their textbook, so I will stick with that. If you're interested in more details, either go to the Heidman textbook or the, my monograph. You will have uh, links later in this presentation. Right, so this is pure multiplicative. It means that we multiply level by trend by seasonality and we get our uh, structure. Finally, we can have a mixture. We can combine them in different ways. For example, add level to trend and multiply by seasonality. Or we can, you know, multiply the two and add seasonality and so on. And there's a lot of combinations of these. In fact, there are 30 of them. And this is what uh, ETS model is in a way. It, it's, uh, it is uh, a model that has a variety of uh, trend components, additive and multiplicative, variety of seasonal components, additive, multiplicative, and uh, similar with error term. Error term can be additive or it can be multiplied by the structure. So we end up, here's one of those uh, plots that I have in my blog and Heinemann has in their textbook, Heinemann et al. So what we see here, we see different types of the ETS model. ETS stands for error trend and seasonality. And the idea is the first letter corresponds to the error, 
The next one corresponds to trend and the last one corresponds to seasonality. For example, this first plot that we see here in the top left corner, it is M and N. It is multiplicative error, no trend, no seasonality. And this is how time series might look according to this model. When we have some seasonality, we can see seasonal patterns. When we have trend, we see growth and different types of seasonalities lead to different uh, trajectories. For example, this one, it is MAM. We can see that there is growth, but it is also an expanding uh, amplitude of seasonality. So the variance is increasing as well. That's what the ETS MAM model uh, is able to capture. So we have 15 like this, and then we have another 15 with uh, additive error instead of multiplicative, which gives us 30 models. And uh, in practice, when we use ETS, the simple thing that uh, that is done automatically is uh, the function will fit either all of these models or a pool of these models and select the one that has the lowest information criteria. I'm not going to explain what information criteria is, so this is uh, a task for your homework if you uh, if you don't know that. But very roughly, it shows you which model is more appropriate to the data. Let's put it this way. Right, so this is ETS. Now, there are other approaches, right? Because we can capture structure somehow differently. For example, we can find relations over time. This is uh, ARIMA. Uh, in order to understand it better, let's answer the question, do sales today depend on sales in the past? The correct answer is no. It doesn't, but let's assume that they do for a moment. Uh, the idea here is that we want, we, we are saying in a way that on average, 90% of yesterday sales will happen today. That's what uh, AR1 model is about. And it, it works very well and it makes perfect sense in technical context. For example, when you want to model temperature in the room or things like that, because temperature five minutes ahead will depend on the temperature right now. And most probably there will be some proportion there. So you can capture it using AR model. In case of uh, sales, it's a bit more challenging to understand what this really means, but you know, the model not all models are wrong, but some are useful as Box, uh, Judge Box uh, summarized. So this is one of the useful models, autoregressive one. In fact, this is AR1, but we can expand it and make it uh, bigger. We can include other lags, not just on the previous step, like five minutes ago, but uh, on the step P. So let's say 40 minutes ago, five times eight, if P is equal to eight and so on. We can have AR of an order P and we can somehow select P that would be most suitable for your data. So this is autoregression. Right, but uh, if we refer to the Box and Jenkins textbook, they do not stop at that. They, can al they also say that uh, sometimes actual values on next observation might depend on the noise. So we can have a structure which correlates with past noise, something like this. Uh, it's difficult to understand this in our context, context because we are saying that white noise leads to 30% increase in sales in the next period. But if we talk about um, technical systems again, it makes perfect sense because, okay, uh, there are some fluctuations in the air in the room, which we could uh, consider as white noise. And these fluctuations will lead to the differences in the temperature in the next observation. Um, and once again, as I say, this is still a useful model. So moving average, why not? This is MA1, but we can expand it in a similar way as we did with AR1. We can make it MAQ. So we are using not just the white noise that we had five minutes ago, but also 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, and so on. And we have a model that depends on these values. Okay, so that's another way. The third way is actually we need to take differences because some structure may be captured if we switch to them. So instead of working with sales on their own, we might be, it might make sense to look at the changes of sales, right? So we can define the differences like this. It's current sales minus yesterday's sales and they equal to epsilon t to the white noise. This model is called random walk model. 
not going into many details about that. And this is this corresponds to I1, so integration of order one. We can even have second differences or third differences, differences of differences, and so on. Uh, but uh, going beyond two is probably is typically not needed, let's say, for the majority of time series. So this is the third way how to capture the the structure in Arima. And actually, we can unite AR, I, and MA and have a bigger model, Arima PDQ, which will have elements of uh, autoregression, auto -regression, elements of uh, differences, and elements of moving average. And this is the second approach, the second big approach. The first one is ETS, we get structure by decomposing time series. The second one is, is this, we get structure by uh, regressing or capturing relation between the current observation and the previous ones. Right, are there any other ways? Yes, there is regression. And this is sort of a sensible way. We can also have some external information, right? For example, for sales, we might have price changes, promotional activities, income, and a lot of other things. And we would, I would argue that they might drive our sales because if price goes down, we expect people to buy more. Or if there is a product on promotion, buy one, get one free or anything else, then sales will go up again. So we capture this structure via regression. And this is very well known instrument, which I'm not going to spend much time on. So X1 here can be, for example, price, and XK here can be promotional activity of a company. And that's another way how to get structure, and then uh, we have our noise. So these three look separate, right? Because one is the, the decomposition, another is over time, dynamic elements, and the third one is the static regression. Uh, and these three fundamental approaches are considered in almost all textbooks as separate ones, as distinct. Like we have ETS, we have ARIMA, we have regression, we can produce forecasts from them, we can then compare, select the best, and so on. Um, and typically they are formulated differently, so they are not comparable. So for example, if you use forecast package, ETS there is not comparable with ARIMA and then both of them are not comparable with LM regression from R. I'm talking about R uh, in this presentation, just a, a side note. Um, but in some cases, we can connect some of these, for example, ETS and regression, ETSX, ARIMA and regression, ARIMA X, and no, not many people do ETS plus ARIMA, but ETS plus AR elements happens from time to time. But even then, still, we think that ETS and the RIMA are sort of separate things and are not comparable. Here comes so, Adam, actually. That's uh, the thing that uh, I, I developed based on all these pieces. I thought that we can use, uh, we can unite them somehow. Adam stands for Augmented Dynamic Adaptive Model, and it is a single source of error state space model. If this doesn't tell you much, don't bother. If it does, then you know what's it about. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I would recommend going to the text, uh, monograph that I have. Now, what it implements, it implements ETS, ARIMA, regression, all in one framework, meaning that you can use ETS in one time series uh, and then ARIMA to the same time series and compare them, for example, using information, information criteria, or you can combine them, you can have uh, weird model, which has ETS uh, plus ARIMA plus regression elements in it. It makes it quite powerful, this combination, but that's not all, because there are other elements here. So we can have uh, components and variables and orders selection in Adam framework. We can have normal and non-normal distributions, because typically we assume that that uh, white noise follows normal distribution, but who said that that's uh, a reasonable assumption. In some cases, we might go with Laplace or log normal or anything else. And in fact, if you build multiplicative models, then log normal distribution makes more sense than the normal one. And then there are some technical aspects that come uh, together with Adam, which is you, you can use a variety of uh, loss functions to estimate these models. You can have the built-in ones, you can have custom ones, and there are more. 
things. The full list uh, is on the website again. Right. So this this is the uh, the framework that unites all those things. How do we achieve this? Well, this is the single source of error state space model that I told you about. But I'm not gonna spend much time. I just uh, thought that uh, I should place some formula on my slide because otherwise it doesn't look uh, as nice. I'm very used to having formulas in my presentations. So this model uh, has uh, components here. The vector v contains typically level trend seasonality. It can also contain ARIMA components, or it can contain parameters parameters of regression. And the idea here is that these components somehow change over time, and then they are used uh, in order to reproduce our actual value. The thing is that uh, this model underlies all ETS models, ARIMA models, and it also underlies regression. So having one framework allows us to unite all those things. Um, Adam is sort of an instrument for your purposes. It's done, it, it was developed uh, keeping in mind that when we might want to have some sort of benchmarking, you know, ETS model uh, has several implementations in R, but the one that I had in smooth package, the ES function was a bit slow and not very accurate. So Adam has that functionality and works well as a benchmark. It's good for experimenting. So you can try a variety of things, different initial values of states, different smoothing parameters and so on. It's also good for prototyping. You might, you know, develop something, some code uh, that works for you and then implement it in your software if you want. And finally, it's good for research because of the second element, because of the flexibility. So here is the link, uh, openforecast.org, uh, Adam. Uh, and you can find all the details uh, about Adam there. But keep in mind that this is still in draft stage. I'm still developing this uh, and improving all the time. So if you have any comments at any point, please do get in touch with me. I, I would really appreciate any feedback. OK. Now I could go, could spend a lot of time going through all the features of Adam. But instead, we will consider several uh, case studies. Excuse me for a moment. Hey. Sorry for that. OK, so we will have three case studies today. First is fast moving consumer goods. The second is promotional modeling. And the third one is intermittent demand. We start with fast moving consumer goods. You know, the idea is that you sell something that is sold relatively fast. It doesn't stay long uh, in your stock. So th these are products easy to predict, relatively easy to predict. And the series that I have here is the sales of household product on a store level. <clears throat> If I remember correctly, this is from M5 competition, should have added uh, reference. Uh, but what we see in this time series is that there is seasonality. It changes over time, level changes uh, over time as well. Maybe there is a slight trend, not really sure. Or maybe this is just a slowly changing level of time series. Um, we will use the last year as the test set just to see how models perform and whether we should uh, improve our model or not. Uh, so, as I said, level changes, seasonality, and they both seem to evolve over time. So, as the result, we will use ETS to, to predict this one. We could use ARIMA, but uh, I like exponential smoothing. Uh, this is how you can run the code. And by the way, slides uh, are already on GitHub, and Rasul will uh, circulate the link, I think. What's the command here? We have our time series. We um, having a horizon of 12 and asking the function to to use last 12 observations as a holdout. And we are using normal distribution. <clears throat> we get some fit, model fit. Uh, we have some point forecasts here. And this is automatically selected model. It is ETS M and M. It is selected based on information criteria and looks like no trend is better in terms of AIC than some trend. 
uh, smoothing parameter is quite high, which reflects the idea that level is changing fast. Uh, interesting enough, gamma, the smoothing parameter, parameter for seasonality, is not very high. And for the holdout, we have a couple of error measures that I extracted is uh, MACE, mean absolute scaled error, and RMSSE, root mean scale squared error. <clears throat> and these values do not tell us anything useful, but they can be used to compare different models. Okay, so what about the analysis of the residuals? The thing is, when we talk about dynamic models like ETS in forecasting, people don't actually typically care about the analysis of the residuals. But if we look at the statistical methods, then this is a standard thing, isn't it? You fit a regression model, then you analyze residuals, then you improve regression model, and this iterative procedure leads you to a good model at some stage. So we can use something similar for ETS and Adam supports plot methods that will produce a variety of uh, graphs. So let's have a look at them. The first one is actuals versus fitted. It's just a general graph showing how well uh, the tendencies are captured. I would say it's not too bad. You know, we don't see any specific structure in the residuals. The only thing is probably there are some points that lie uh, way below the, the line. Uh, the second one, standardized residuals versus fitted. So we see that this there is this 14, observation number 14, it is sort of an outlier, but it lies, uh, it's just one observation uh, below the bounds. So maybe it's not a big deal. This could happen at random. Uh, residuals versus absolute residuals versus fitted. The idea here is that uh, the line should be straight. Then this would mean that we don't have any heteroscedasticity. And in this case, uh, I would argue that it's not very. Um, changing, you know, we don't see any obvious tendency here. And finally, QQ plot of normal distribution. We can see that almost all points are on, close to the line, which is good. There is only one observation, most probably this, number 14, which is uh, a bit way, way off. Okay, so this slide summarizes what we uh, have seen on the previous one. Some things could have happened at uh, random, so just to analyze things further, <coughs> we'll produce additional plots. Now there is parameter which here, and there is documentation that explains what sort of plots it will produce if we use these numbers. Uh, eight is the standardized residuals versus time, and we see that th there is this observation number 14 again, and similar in studentized residuals versus time. It is here, but if we look at it, the neighboring values are all below the line, which sort of indicates that maybe this hasn't happened at random. And ACF, PACF, we can use them in order to improve the model and add AAR or MA components from ARIMA. <clears throat> but for now, let's not bother about that. So observation number 14 might not be random. Let's see how it looks on our plot. Here it is. We can see that it is really off in this specific instance. And what uh, I would try to do is let's uh, let's see if uh, we can interpolate it somehow. Well, actually included in the model. So we create dummy variable, which is equal to zero everywhere. But on this observation number 14, there it is equal to one. So we are approximating our um, potential outlier. We build the model, and here's what we have. Now we have AACC 768. Let's have a look. Sorry, scroll back. It was 761. Now it is 768, so it increased, which means that uh, this doesn't help. So most probably, we shouldn't bother about that. Uh, so ETS MNM is good enough. And when we do, uh, we can have additional plots, for example, to see how the time series is decomposed according to this model. So we have level component, which we discussed, we have seasonality, we have residuals. And yeah, for some reason I've left X here for the dummy variable. We can also have, have a look at the output with uh, estimates of parameters, alpha, gamma, level, and uh, their confidence intervals. <clears throat> this, these are based to those of you who know that is based on Fisher information, so they're not uh, ideal. 
um, but I struggle to find a better way to, to get them. There is bootstrap as well, but uh, it is a computationally expensive approach. Right, and then we can do final forecast with some uh, interval, and that's the line that we get from our data. So after looking at the holdout, we've produced some forecast. This is an example of fast moving consumer goods. Uh, <clears throat> let's go briefly through promotional modeling and a bit of intermittent demand. Now with this series, this is not M5, that's a separate data. This is weekly data from one of our clients. Uh, and we see that there are some promotions happening. Um, and uh, these promotions seem to increase the sales. So if we just fit it a dynamic model like ETS or ARIMA, we would miss these promotions. And this means that we would miss that useful information. So we need to use model with explanatory variables and I will use ETS X once again, because I love ETS. Uh, and we will use this selection. What, what is happening in this line of code? PPP stands for the pure models. So it will be either pure additive model or pure multiplicative model. <clears throat> I argue that uh, they are safer to work with than the mixed models because mixed models might break, especially if you have data close to zero. Now we have a uh, variable lux here, which specifies what sort of lux to use, given that we have weekly data, we have 52 weeks per year. So that's why I use 52 here. And we will also produce forecast for 52 steps ahead and we will have the holdout. Uh, that's what uh, we get from the model. Because this model does not include the promotions uh, in the holdout period, it reproduces the pattern that it has seen in the previous ones. Let's, uh, that took just 2.6 seconds, which is, I think, not, not too bad. Uh, AAC, let's remember that 3072. And the next step is let's introduce dummy variables for the promotions. And we also will introduce lags. So we're creating data set, uh, not data set, sorry, um, data frame that includes our explain, uh, our variable and the set of explanatory variables with uh, promotions and locked promotions. The idea with locked promotions is, is that we want to see what will happen next day after the promotion happened. And when we look at the literature on promotional modeling, typically they say that if people go uh, the first week and buy two cases of beer uh, on a discount, then week after they won't go and buy at all. So they won't go, won't need any more beer, right? Uh, although a good friend of mine, Eve, would uh, argue uh, about that and say that uh, you always need more beer. All right, so if we include this and we fit the model with all the explanatory variables, that's what we get as a forecast. Some of these uh, points are a bit higher than needed, but that's a, bit, uh, a better uh, fit, I would say. And if we look at the AAC, it has decreased to 3040 instead of 3072. Now, given AACC values, we should stick with uh, ETX ETS X M and N, uh, M and M, <laughs> and uh, we could also use Arima and compare it with ETS. So this is just an example. Um, let's not spend too much time on this line. The idea here is that the function will select A R I and M A orders automatically, and if we do that, this is the feed that we get, and it is uh, worse than the previous one as we see visually, and the AACC here is higher, so we should just stick with ETSX. Now, if we produce the final forecast, that's how it will look, because the last two observations are way below all the other observations. Um, maybe this is uh, the issue with recording, or maybe there is some structural change in the sales, you know, some shop has closed or whatever else, but that's what the model produces. If we think that these two points are not needed here, they happened for whatever poor reason, like this does not represent reality, then we can include these points as explanatory variables and we can uh, fit produce a, a more reasonable forecast if we think that it is better than the previous one.
So that's another case of promotional modeling. As you see, the first one was more focused on just ETS. This one is more focused on dynamic model with explanatory variables. And the third thing I wanted to show you is the intermittent demand. Intermittent demand is an interesting uh, thing on its own. This is how it looks, just one of the examples. What we see here is that not only the values occur at random, so we might not have uh, any sales in some of the weeks, uh, but also the values themselves, the demand sizes, uh, are random. <clears throat> so there are two things here, and this is a hobbies product. I think this is also from M5 competition. Um, and we can use the IETS model, uh, which I developed with uh, John Boylan, and the paper on that is to be submitted to IEGPE, International Journal for Production Economics, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, the idea for the model is that instead of trying to capture the full time series as it, it is, we split it into two parts. The first will be demand occurrence. So the, the series that says whether demand occurs or not, zeros and ones. And the other series would be demand sizes. So just exclusively non-zero demand sizes. And here is an example of how demand occurrence looks. Uh, so if it is uh, white zone, then there is no demand. If it is black, then there is a demand. So zero, one thing. Now, we can see from this plot uh, that the demand occurrence sort of changes over time, right? The density in the beginning is quite low, while at the end uh, it is much bigger. So we could say that the demand on product is sort of building up. <clears throat> you know, we are seeing more and more people interested in the product, buying it and so on. So this sort of behavior can be captured by one of uh, the models that we've developed. And, uh, and da, 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 we'll use the model with the trend because the idea is that we expect that maybe in the future there will be further increase in, in the demand occurrence. So we will use the model with multiplicative trend for the demand occurrences. And there is a special function in smooth package, in this smooth package uh, OES, which uh, allows fitting the model and we will fit ETS MMN. I'm not going to explain what is uh, currents equal to direct. There's a, a lot. Of, I would need a separate presentation on that. And this is roughly how the model fits the data. Uh, while it might not be ideal, maybe some ways to improve it, but we can see that it predicts the increase in the probability of occurrence. So we expect uh, an increase in sales. Now, what about the data in itself, the demand sizes? We see that they are also increasing over time. So we will try to model with the trend and we will ask function to select the best pure multiplicative model that would fit the data. YYY stands for the either multiplicative or no uh, trend and the same for seasonality. And we get uh, our final forecast uh, using the forecast function and we produce the plot. Now, this thing is uh, not very user friendly, not very readable. So let's zoom in. By zooming in, ah, yeah, an important thing that I should say is that in this instance, I decided to align this forecast with well, some sort of inventory decisions. You know, we're predicting something. And uh, we are assuming that <clears throat> we need to predict something over the lead time of 28 days. So uh, we, we order today and in 28 days we get our delivery and we will see, uh, we, we need to satisfy the demand that we will have uh, over that period. Okay, so maybe I'm not explaining it that well, but the idea is that you need to look at the cumulative demand over this period of time. And uh, these lines, they correspond to the cumulative values. <clears throat> this is not very helpful and does not tell us how good the model is. So what I will do next, I will sum up all the demand uh, sizes that happen in the holdout. And I will plot them versus the, the safety stock that the model recommends. This is just for one time series, one uh, origin. So it's not very representative. We would need to repeat it many times to get a better picture. But the idea is the following. This black dot corresponds to the cumulative sales over the 28 days. So overall, we will have something like 40 to 42 units sold. 
the blue line is the working stock which is not very useful but the red line is much more important and useful this is the safety stock recommended by our model so uh, this is set to 95 percent 95 percent so it tells uh, that uh, in 95 percent of the cases our uh, cumulative demand over this period of uh, time will be below this line and i think it's 49 so we can see that it is uh, okay for this specific case it is a bit above the value but that's what we would expect for the safety stock to to, to show us and as i say this is just an example i'm not going to go into experiments here it just shows you what you can do with the function you get this cumulative safety stock uh, automatically as soon as you set the horizon right i've talked enough uh, to the conclusions we go uh, as you see, Adam is a quite flexible model. It supports many features. It has uh, ETS and Arima in included in it. It was actually developed mainly for demand forecasting. I had it in mind when I was working on, on the model and the functions, <clears throat> but it can be used for other areas as well. It can be used for the standard problems instead of the ES from Smooth or ETS from Forecast or ETS from Fable. It can, includes Arima and it can handle regresses. And you see, uh, the idea of this presentation was to show you how flexible it is and what you can do with it if you want to. There is much more in it. So there is multiple seasonalities. It can, as I showed, it can handle intermittent demand. There are also even uh, scale uh, model components there. So something related to garage elements. Uh, so it can do a lot of things other things and uh, if you're interested please do have a look at this monograph uh, follow this link and this is available in smooth in the smooth package for r uh, the function is called adam